Welcome, I'm Tracy Smith and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. On this special edition, we feature interviews and exclusive excerpts from our sit-downs with three American journalists. We start with Rachel Maddow. In her book, Prequel, An American Fight Against Fascism, Maddow examines a rarely discussed part of American history, the rise of ultra-right beliefs in the United States ahead of World War II, a time when some sided with Nazi Germany. Rita Braver sat down with her to explore the stories of extremism from three quarters of a century ago and what we could learn from them today. It may be hard to fathom that some 20,000 Americans would gather under an image of George Washington for a pro-Nazi rally in Madison Square Garden in 1939. So this is just a tiny sample of what you've amassed. Yeah, my apartment, God, <laughs> it's a real, it's it's a real mess of this stuff, stuff at this point. Huh? But Rachel Maddow has spent the last few years sifting through a ream of sobering stories for her new book, Prequel, An American Fight Against Fascism. It's a cautionary tale about threats to democracy set in the era of World War II. Not only were there lots of Americans who didn't want us to fight, but there was a lot of them who wanted us to fight on the other side with, with the, the Germans, Nazis. With the Nazis. Um, Maddow, who of course hosts a show on MSNBC, first explored the story in a series of podcasts focusing on surprising connections between Americans and Nazi interests. The organizational diversity of people who were on that side of the calculus ahead of World War II is shocking to me. Some of the most unsettling stories Maddow tells are of a nationwide network of underground pro-Nazi anti-Semitic groups, like one exposed by Arnold Eric Severide, who would become a renowned CBS News commentator. Eric Severide was a very young reporter when he uncovered what? The Silver Shirts. There was a group of very far-right extremists that were meeting secretly all over Minneapolis. They were forming themselves into armed cells all across the country to mount a war against the Jews and to set up a Hitler-style dictatorship here. This little bookshop is the California headquarters of the Silver Shirt Movement and Friends of the New Germany. And Severide infiltrated this group and basically decided, yes, they're crazy, but they're also serious. And this New York armory essentially became a supply depot for another anti-Semitic militia, the Christian Front. They had a captain on the inside in the 165th Infantry Unit that was willing to give them all this ammunition and cordite and hand grenade explosives, and they used it to stockpile bombs. What did they plan to do with it? That is why the FBI arrested them in mid-January 1940, the FBI. They thought they were only about seven days ahead of the Christian Front plan to murder a bunch of congressmen, to firebomb and bomb a bunch of sites in New York City that they thought would be sensitive enough that they would set off essentially a race war. 18 people were charged with seditious conspiracy and theft of government property. And what happened? They got off. Either a hung jury or an acquittal for all of them, the way it was received was uh, that was a Brooklyn verdict for some Brooklyn boys, that they were seen as being sort of hometown heroes. And being rabidly anti-Semitic, even violently so, was seen as a form of sort of patriotic anti-communism. And long before the internet became a conduit for disinformation, the Harmony Club, where Maddow and I sat down to talk, figured into a sinister attempt to demonize Jews. The Harmony Club is the second oldest private club in New York City. It was specifically a club for Jews who were restricted from entering the other private clubs. And in 1939, some unsavory characters, including a former army general, claimed to a congressional committee that they'd learned of a plot being hatched here at the Harmony Club that might involve prominent Jews affiliated with the Roosevelt administration, including Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter and Treasury Secretary Henry Morgenthau. House Un-American Activities Committee, which had just started, heard from a pair of witnesses who brought them a story about this place. These guys came to Congress and said, those Jews are plotting a takeover of the United States to destroy the United States and put the Jews in charge, and we're here to blow the whistle on it. 
and it was all fabricated. Completely fabricated. And this conspiracy theory they hatched about this place, this room, was part and parcel of trying to turn Americans into feeling about the Jews the way Hitler was making Germans feel about the Jews. So this address right And Hitler had plenty of tentacles in the U.S., including right on Riverside Drive in Manhattan. So George Sylvester Vierick lived here in a beautiful 10-room apartment. He was very well off. And the reason he was so well off is because he was the highest paid and most senior Nazi propaganda agent in the United States. He was known for being a spy during World War I, and then in the run-up to World War II, he's at it again? He's at it again. Actually convicted of spying, Vierek gets off on legal technicalities and goes on to run an operation directly linked to Capitol Hill. They'd get Nazi propaganda into the United States. They'd persuade a member of Congress or a senator to put his or her name on it, insert it into the congressional record. Once it's in the congressional record, they can send it out in bulk all over the United States. Maddow calls out World War II-era senators like Ernest Blundin of Minnesota and Burton Wheeler of Montana, as well as House member Hamilton Fish III of New York as being in cahoots with Vierick. U.S. indicts its top fascists. And then but when the federal government finally them, indicts some two dozen people, including George Sylvester Vierick and several congressional staffers, in a seditious conspiracy, why are none of the members of Congress indicted? Good question. A lot of pressure was put on the Justice Department by members of Congress who are implicated in this scheme. And even that case sputters. The trial is chaos, bedlam, a circus. The prosecution is actually presenting a pretty compelling case. And seven months into it, the judge dies. That's right. The judge dies from a heart attack. And after hemming and hawing for a few years, the Justice Department decides not to spend time retrying the case. And the American people start to turn their attention to the war rather than to any sort of fight like this at home. In 35 U.S. cities, boons headed by local Gropenführers. Though Maddow's book takes place three quarters of a century ago, there's a reason it's called prequel. After all, it was written in the wake of the attack on the United States Capitol. Do you think we are now seeing a resurgence of fascism in our country? I think we are seeing another iteration of the ultra-right. And it has a lot of the elements that are the most worrying things that you look for when you're looking at a democracy that's in trouble of yielding to authoritarianism. We see violence intruding into the political process. We see the scapegoating of minorities and cons dangerous conspiracy theories about A them. rise in anti-Semitism? Rising anti-Semitism is an absolute red flag. Anti-Semitism almost always goes with the rise in fascist ideation. And it's just something that we can't ignore. There's a history here that we ought to learn from. Americans before us, just as smart, just as resourceful, just as funny, just as clear-minded as any of us could ever hope to be, fought those fights before us. We can learn from what they did. And now, here's an exclusive extended interview from Rita Braver and Rachel Maddow, something you can only see right here on Here Comes the Sun. You're saying here in your book that President Harry Truman hid evidence of the complicity of members of Congress of the U.S. with the Nazis. Why would he do that? He never explained himself. I wish he had. He definitely did that. You <laughs> and don't it's find any records of why? No. And Truman was very aggressively criticized for it. We found sheafs and sheafs of letters in the Truman Presidential Library of Americans writing to President Truman saying, are you kidding? John Rogge ought to be attorney general and fire this guy, Tom Clark. Can't believe you fired this. What are you doing protecting these members of Congress? John Rogge, in defiance of the higher ups, actually starts spilling some of the information that's in this report. And he ends up getting fired. Yes. And, you know, John Rogge is, in some ways a hero, but in some ways he's breaking some very important rules. Because it's now classified information. 
it's at least secret information. It's not cleared by the Justice Department to be public information. And he nevertheless makes it public. And that's not OK. The investigative powers of the Justice Department are only to be used for official purposes. We don't have secret police in this country. We don't have secret criminal proceedings. And so when Rocky decides, I'm going to tell everybody anyway, he really is going rogue. And so you can judge him for that. And it makes sense that they fired him. But we can also understand his reasons for doing it. We are also seeing a new form of disinformation. Yes. I mean, a lot of people think of disinformation as something modern that comes to us over social media. But you're telling us, hey, this has been around for a long time, and we need to be aware of it. It's another one of those key factors you look for when a democracy is really under attack. Is there a well-funded, comprehensive disinformation assault? that is designed to make people not believe their lion eyes, make people believe that there is no knowable truth, make people distrust journalism, expertise, science. That is a way of dislocating people from what they know is true and right. So what do we need to do about that in this country as we see the rise of these kinds of elements again? I think we need to learn from the lessons of history. I think we do need to protect law enforcement, protect the Justice Department from political intimidation. I think we need to protect our real political system from the intrusion of violence, from paramilitary groups, which are illegal everywhere in the United States, but we nevertheless have this proliferation of them. We need to protect people who are involved in even the lowest levels of politics from physical intimidation. We need to protect minorities, and we need to protect the Jewish community in America from the scapegoating that we are seeing and the attacks on them. We need to make sure that our democracy is strong in ways big and small. We need to make sure that people feel like the way you change things in this country is by voting and by working working for political change, not by trying to bring about some sort of violent revolution. The Astor family once ruled New York City society and owned a substantial slice of the city's real estate. Anderson Cooper traces the family's roots from their first American patriarch, a German immigrant, to the philanthropist heir who gave away the fortune. He sat down with our Califasane. John Jacob Astor and then his son for generations, they were just buying up parcels here and there and then large tracts of land further north. Astor Place in New York's Greenwich Village is named for John Jacob Astor, America's first multimillionaire. Astor died in 1848 with one regret. He wished he had bought more real estate. <laughs> yeah, there's a famous quote, you know, had I to do it over again, I would have you know, put every nickel I had in, in New York real estate. Astor made his money through the bloody and brutal beaver fur trade. He saw the huge markups that beaver fur could get, you know, 600, 700, 800 percent markups. Mm. And John Jacob Astor went out into the wilderness and started trading with indigenous populations. By 1834, his fur trading company was the largest business enterprise in the United States. It was also a ruthless business, right. the way he operated. Astor was astonishingly ruthless, according to Anderson Cooper's new book, co-written with historian Catherine Howe. He would screw over the traders that worked for him. They would have to buy them at marked up prices, so then the, their incentive was to screw over the indigenous populations who they were trading beaver pelts from. And by the next generation, you have William Astor, who owns all these buildings right. in New York. You refer to him as a slumlord. Yes. I mean, the Astors were slumlords, there's no doubt about it. They would rent out the land to a sub-landlord, mm -hmm. and that sub-landlord's business was to build whatever building they wanted on that land. But within 20 years or so, the lease would be up, and anything built on that land would revert to the Astor family. So there was no incentive for any sub-landlord to keep up a building. Today, the Astor name is etched into the infrastructure of New York City. This is the Astor Place subway station, which still has a kind of an homage to the Astor family and to their origin. A lot of people probably wonder, why are there beavers here chewing on trees? And this is a reference to the creation of the Astor fortune. Beavers are adorable, but the Astors... Is there anyone good in this story of the Astors? Look, people are multifaceted, and I think every family has heroes and villains. That, that, that sounds like a no. If someone asks whether I'm a good person, and the answer is, well, he's multifaceted, <laughs> that's not a good sign. One of Cooper's favorite Astors wasn't originally part of the family. 
Brooke Astor, born Roberta Brooke Russell, was the third and final wife of Vincent Astor, who had become the richest man in America after his father, Jack Astor, died aboard the Titanic. Vincent Astor realized, wait a minute, we're, we're slumlords? He was not happy to learn this. He was definitely not easy to be around. Smoke, drank, unbelievable amount. He sold off some of the family's assets and started a foundation with what Cooper describes as a vague notion of bettering humankind. He died in 1959, leaving his fortune and foundation to his widow, Brooke. In that five and a half years of often miserable marriage, she put up with a lot and she inherited all of Vincent Astor's money. Hmm. And she rehabilitated the Astor name. She really embraced this idea of being both an Astor yes. and a philanthropist, right? Yes. Brooke Astor focused on giving back to New York City. And she would dress up in her fur coats and her Chanel. And she would go to housing projects and homeless shelters because she wanted to see how the money she was giving hmm. would be spent. That was Brooke Astor. Cooper and co-author Catherine Howe at times rely heavily on a handful of sources, which has raised some questions about the diligence of their research. We asked Cooper about this. He replied, We have written what we hope is a compelling and accessible account of the Astors, and have relied on, and rigorously cited, dozens of books, contemporary accounts, and historical documents. In the book, Cooper also recalls his personal interactions. As a 13-year-old, he first met Brooke Astor while at lunch with his mother, Gloria Vanderbilt. Your mother, Gloria Vanderbilt, really the last of the Vanderbilts in yeah. a way. Brooke Astor, the last of the Astors. Yeah. If somebody passing by the restaurant in that moment had seen Brooke Astor and my mom sitting, you know, shoulder to shoulder essentially, that's the thought they would have had, like these two sort of iconic, you know, representatives of a vanishing past. Cooper says his mother and Brooke were not friends. Brooke Astor was the toast of New York society, and my mom chose a different path, and I think that's part of the tension she felt with Brooke Astor. Gloria, who was born a Vanderbilt, was someone Brooke probably would have wanted to befriend, a reversal from more than a century earlier, when the Astors wanted nothing to do with the Vanderbilts. The Vanderbilts were considered the nouveau riche. Commodore Vanderbilt died with $100 million, but he also was a very uncouth guy. It was the Commodore's grandchildren who set about this enterprise of breaking into New York society. That meant getting past Caroline Astor, who created and controlled New York's social register. She called it the Astor 400. Which was allegedly the 400 people who could fit in Caroline Astor's ballroom. And they created the rules for it. You had to have a French chef and French architecture. She defined it in a way that benefited her. But Cooper's great-great-aunt, Alva Vanderbilt, found a way in. She decided to throw a party the likes of which America had never seen. And Caroline Astor's daughter, Carrie, really wanted to go to this party. Finally, Caroline Astor folded to the pressure, and Mrs. Astor finally recognized the Vanderbilts. Hmm. Anderson yeah, Cooper says he always Canada knew there would be no Vanderbilt place. money left for his inheritance. He swears that was fine with him. Inheriting wealth never ends well, he says. Brooke Astor spent her final years struggling with her son from a previous marriage, Tony Marshall. When Brooke Astor decided to step back from the foundation because of Alzheimer's, she decided not to give it to Tony. Basically telling him, one day, none of this will be yours. Yes. And yet, as Brooke Astor's mental faculties declined, her working relationship with her son became suspiciously close. Tony was accused, ultimately, of stealing money from his mom, doing things without her knowledge. He's eventually convicted he of was. theft. He stood trial, uh, he was convicted. This era of these great families kind of comes to an end, but of course, we have our Elon Musks and our Zuckerbergs. How do our plutocrats measure up to these older American plutocrats? The histories have yet to be written about the mega wealthy people today and what the impact of their fortunes will be on subsequent generations and their families. Will the lessons of these other families be learned? You know, I, I would recommend they read these books. Here's an exclusive excerpt from Califasane and Anderson Cooper. Tell me about the first time you met Brooke Astor. I met Brooke Astor 
when I was 13 for the first time, I was in a restaurant called Mortimer's, which in New York in the early 80s, Mortimer's was like the see and be seen society restaurant. It was nothing to speak of. It was two small rooms. It was a very New York Upper East Side society restaurant. And one day, a little old lady in a big fur coat comes in and I sort of recognized her. I, I, seen some pictures of her in, in papers. She came by the table and she said something to my mom and my brother and I stood up and we both shook her hand and that was the first time I met Brooke Astor. And I knew right away my mom didn't like her. <laughs> um, I could always just tell. I was right. like a student of my mom. She was a really interesting character, but I knew my mom didn't like her, so the conversation was short. But Brooke Astor was like seated right next to us. So, But after lunch, I asked my mom, you know, What's up with Brooke Astor? And or I said, like, why don't you like her? I was like, I could tell you didn't like her. Why don't you like her? And she, my, all my mom would say was, she just never grabbed me. Hmm. Which for my mom, it meant a lot. But my mom never like would say bad things about people. She would just say like, oh yeah, she didn't grab me. Do you like her more now, having written this book, than you did when you ran into her at that restaurant? <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting. So. I ran into her when I was 13 for the first time. I, a couple of years later, I worked in that restaurant. I worked as a waiter in the restaurant one summer. And there was a moment I had another encounter with her where we were passing by each other in the restaurant. I was working. I was a terrible waiter. I was all sweating. <laughs> and I said, oh, hi, Mrs. Astor. And she looked at me for a second. And our eyes met. And she clearly didn't remember. I'd met her by then uh, several times mm -hmm. as a kid with my mom. But she looked at me, and I was dressed in my waiter outfit. And she basically looked right through me. And she almost was going to smile when she heard her name. And then she looked at me and realized there was no need to because I was sort of nobody. Right. And she just kept on walking. And maybe she was having a bad day. And you know, I don't, I don't hold it against her. But it, for me at the time, when I, I was probably, I don't know, six, 17 years old at the time, it was a really interesting experience to have. And I didn't view it as a judgment on her, but I just thought it just, it, it taught me something. I wonder as I read your books and think about the ways these families literally physically shape the city. Mm. And it made me wonder, are the new billionaires shaping our physical environment in the same way? I don't know if it's physical environment, but I mean, they're shaping, you know, our, our certainly our social environment mm. and our technological environment. So yeah. It, Perhaps wisely, I'm sure they have incredible houses, mm -hmm. um, but they're not putting their entire fortunes into mega mansions right. that will be torn down in a generation. At least I assume they're not. Or their fortunes are so big they can do both. They can have huge houses mm -hmm. uh, and do other things. It, it seems like the question is not so much who makes the money and what they do with it. It's what happens to the money the next generation, right. and the generation after that, and the generation after that. Did having kids change the way you think about legacy and inheritance? Yeah, I mean, it didn't change the way. First of all, it, having kids made me want to understand my mom's family story mm. in a way that I never did before. Right. I thought no good could come of looking at the Vanderbilts because it has no impact on my life. I'm not inheriting any money from that. And it just seemed like, why have that as some sort of guidepost. Like, I'd much rather look at the Coopers, and that seems like a more hard scrabble. That seems a more sensible guidepost to have. But when I had kids, I wanted to figure out what would I tell my kids about where they come from and who their great-great-grandparents were, and what would I say about this strange history. And so unless I could understand it myself, I didn't know what I would tell my kids. Um, but I think for all of us, looking at the, the past, looking at the arc of American history through these families, I think it's an important thing. It, it, it gives us a sense of, of our own families and the cycles we see in our own families. Mm. This is clearly playing out in a, in a very public way with the Astors or the Vanderbilts. But it is a story of an American family or an American fortune. And you, know, you see your own relatives in these people. You're like, oh yeah, it's the crazy uncle. That's <laughs> that guy. Or it's the, the conniving guy or right. whatever it is. And, um, and I find that, that really interesting. NBC News journalist Tom Brokaw covered some of the biggest news stories of the 20th century throughout his storied career. He credits his success, in part, to his scrappy childhood growing up on the prairies of South Dakota 
as he told our Jane Polly. Life in the streets of Beijing. He would never have imagined biking through Tiananmen Square. Only one passing bicyclist seemed to know what we were up to. For 20 years, Tom Brokaw was at the helm of NBC Nightly News, in El Salvador, delivering the news of the day. Uh, and we have a remarkable development here tonight at the Brandenburg Gate. And sometimes the news of a lifetime. The wall is effectively down. That was one of the biggest stories of the 20th century, and I was the only one there. The only one? of the big three. Peter Jennings, Dan right. Rather, Tom Brokaw. Right. And we were competing all day, every day. This is NBC Nightly News. And then facing off with Tom Brokaw in New York every night. President Reagan today. Also Colleagues still call him Duncan. Duncan the Wonder Horse for his vaunted capacity for work. Never give up. Could explain where that comes from. Brokaw's latest book is a hybrid, memoir and history. A kind of love letter to his parents and the hardworking people of the Plains who shared a never give up outlook. Is this the story of your success compared to your parents or because of your parents? Oh, it's because of my parents. This is Tom Brokaw's dad. He was the toughest kid in town. If a character had been invented by Mark Twain and Charles Dickens, <laughs> would have been Red Brokaw an elementary school dropout, yeah. a town tough. I don't think anybody tucked him in at night. The youngest of 10, Red Brokaw had a learning disability, quit school in second grade, and went to work at the age of eight. He was doing horrifyingly dangerous jobs. And one of them was digging a deep well and they would put a rope around my dad's legs and drop him down head first into the well. In those times, nobody batted an eye when your father is on some kind of agricultural contraption and if he had fallen off his perch, he would have been shredded. There were no rules in those days and if there were federal regulation, they didn't get all the way to Bristol, South Dakota, I gotta tell you. After the Civil War, like other ambitious young men, Tom's great-grandfather went west and got off the train in Bristol. What opportunity did he think he would find in the middle of nowhere? Nowhere. It was completely barren at that point. And he decided what it really needed was a place where people could find food and find a place to stay. Over the years, the Brokaw House became a local landmark. A family business, everyone worked oyster stew and coleslaw, boiled lamb, duck, roast beef, roast turkey, mashed potatoes, peas, squash, steamed suet pudding, that sounds delicious, mince pie, apple pie, custard pie, blueberry pie, orange pudding, assorted cake. Mrs. Brokaw was in the kitchen and made it all. My grandmother unfortunately died at an early age. She was only 42 because she just worked full time. Throughout his life, it seems Red Brokaw worked all the time. He wanted to be respected. He wanted the people to think well of him. Your parents on yes. their wedding day. How more handsome can they be? Tom's interest in news gathering may have come from his mother, Jean. A working mother, she was the local postmistress. It was like being the head of a newspaper in town. Everything went through the post office. Red Brokaw was as self-made as a working man could be. A genius with heavy machinery, and he could build anything. Harnessing the Missouri River, the first power comes from the fourth largest earth dam in the world, Fort Randall. A muscular monument to a confident post-war America, the Fort Randall Dam stands astride the Missouri River, built in nine years by the Army Corps of Engineers, and an army of working men like Red Brokaw. I think of that dam, and if you build it, they will come. It was a hugely important dam for flood control and other things and for creating power. And jobs. The Brokaw family packed up and headed for Pickstown. Pickstown sounds like a mirage. Pickstown was a magical place and it had everything you can imagine. It had great schools, it had great hospitals, and everybody came from all over America, mostly working class. Pickstown was a manufactured town for the people who would build the dam who found neat houses with state-of-the-art amenities like heat and running water. And at the end of the nine years, they folded it up and shipped it away. 
The story of Tom Brokaw's success begins in Pickstown. When there was a school play, I had a lead. When there was an event that was going on in town in which they needed an MC, guess who they called? Yankton, South Dakota, is what Tom calls home. His high school resume includes governor of South Dakota Boys State, class president. Meredith Auld was vice president, a cheerleader, the doctor's daughter, and his future wife. You've been married for how long? 60 years. Six O. Oh. A six and an O. Oh. When she was about to marry you, she explains to a friend, well, I don't know if we'll make any money, but life will be interesting. Right. Beyond their dreams. In 1976, Tom's career was taking off. That is Dawn coming up over New York this morning. The new host of today. There is a welcome new addition to this set, a kind of Dawn in itself. It is Jane Pauley, <laughs> of course. With a really new newcomer by his side. I knew Gary before he met you. Meredith was a matchmaker. I knew he was showing up in my office a lot. Meredith says, not about you. He wants to meet Jane. I said, oh. Well, on behalf of my children, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to go see the grandson play soccer. Sarah and I and Archer will be looking around Madrid, and then he goes to camp. The Brokaws dote on their three daughters and five grandchildren. It's a commentary on where we've come in life. You know, we now have a grandson who's going away to a soccer camp in Europe. It seems unimaginable from our early oh, oh, life, know. right? Ten years ago, life took a hard turn. Diagnosed with multiple myeloma, an incurable blood cancer. Tom Brokaw wasn't supposed to live to be 83. But Duncan is still the wonder horse. I've had a bad experience. I kept thinking bad things would happen to me. But as I grew older, I began to develop this condition. And what you try to do is control it as much as you can. And I've had to change my life in some way. I really had to give up my daily activity with NBC. I had to walk away from them as they were walking away from me. I just wasn't the same person. And so for the first time in my life, I was kind of out there, you know, in a place I had never been in my life. But what a life it's been. You were deeply formed by your South Dakota roots. You left, but what did you take with you? That you get things done by getting them done. As my family and my friends will all tell you, I never run out of gas. <laughs>
So I could look out and see all of these people in army uniforms. And they had me up there. And my opening line is the only one I remember, which is, they said I was too young to speak a piece tonight. But I spoke whatever it was it was. And when I finished it, I raced back to my dad and got my silver dollar. As a reward for, if, if he could hear you in the back, you got the dollar. I got the, I got the dollar bill. Your father was amazed uh, to see you, the successes that you had. Did he live to see you on nightly news? He just barely made it. I had gotten the job. I was in play, frankly. You know, there were the other networks were trying to get me as well. Yeah. And Dad called me and he said, is all this true, what I'm reading? And I said, Dad, we've never talked about this before. Why are we talking about it now? And he said, as long as I've known you, you've always run out of money at the end of the year. I need to know how much to set aside. But the best part was that others also took notice of it. And it was really important to him. And not in a way he would talk about it that I had arrived at a certain place in life. And I think, even though others knew about this, he would never ever go around beating his chest and say, you ought to see what my time is doing, because he thought that was not the appropriate way to go about things. We had really common uh, pride in each other's ability to do stuff. In your experience as a, a journalist, in your proclivity as a historian, tell me why you think if you do, we're going to be okay. Well, I'll tell you what I think worries me the most right now, frankly, is that we have so acutely divided ourselves as a country. We've got these groups that are really angry about everything, and they're willing to overlook what is going on that they shouldn't overlook. And they're not only angry about it, but they're willing to act on their anger. When you look at what happened at the Capitol, when all those people showed up, wanted to bring down the damn country, we hadn't had anything like that happen before. And one of the things that I said when that was beginning to build up was that we have changed in America. And one of the reasons that we've changed, the instruments of communication are now so available to everybody, they can hit a button, go online and say the most outrageous things you've ever heard. And then the next day they'll have 200,000 followers. And we haven't worked that out yet. You know, we're not broken, we'll never be broken as a country because we have too much strength. But we damn well better start getting together about how we're gonna get through this. And it's gonna mean some compromise on people who have strong feelings. They've gotta find middle ground at some point. Because if we don't, we'll just be coming unraveled as a country. I'm Tracy Smith. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you here next time on Here Comes the Sun.